Therefore, very happy to start this evening's webinar. We're in week five of our rural health onboarding uh, program. Um, it's been very exciting. We've had some extraordinary speakers and contributors over the last few weeks. Um, and this week, we're finally going to focus a little bit on children, the littlies. And that's always, I think, for me, one of the scary scary parts of medicine is when you have a small child coming in who's very, very sick. Um, and both our talks are going to really focus on, on, the, on the really sick child. And tonight specifically focusing on bacterial infections. And we're very happy to have Dr. Lizelle Kiet here with us, who is a specialist pediatrician, DCST at Buffalo City Municipality. And she grew up here in the Eastern Cape and studied medicine and specialized in pediatrics at the University of the Free State. And then fortunately for us, we turned to work at her hometown in East London, where she does this amazing work as a DCST pediatrician for BCM. Very passionate, always around, and very much involved on the ground in the rural district hospitals here, as well as the CHCs. Her passion is caring for children in underserviced communities, and she has a deep love for healthcare workers who serve their communities by working in primary healthcare. Her goal is to grow their self-confidence and make them feel appreciated. During her years of working in primary health care, she's come to realize that we do not need expensive interventions to provide quality care to children. By building on our basic skills as clinicians, we could save most of the children at our facilities. She loves taking long walks on the beautiful Eastern Cape beaches with her dogs, and uh, we're very pleased that she's taken a little bit of time out to share some of her top tips this evening on how to save the lives of those really, really sick little ones that we look after. So thank you very much and um, welcome Dr. Kiet. Thank you, thank you Madeleine. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Um, I really appreciate you. Um, making time after such a must have been a busy and an exhausting day. So thank you very much for that. Okay, so today, whenever I'm given an opportunity to, to address anybody on an issue that is very close to my heart in pediatrics, this is always my go-to topic. So I would like to discuss with you today how to recognize the infant with a serious bacterial infection. And as Madeleine said, my passion is really to keep things very simple. I do understand what it is like to work in a, in a rural facility and the, the issues that come with it and the limitations with regards to things like laboratory investigation. So that's why I believe so much in building on our clinical skills and having the ability to recognize what is in front of us. So I'd like to start by um, telling you about a case that we, we had at one of our CHCs here in East London. Um, just a little background in East London, despite this it being such a big city, we do not have a district hospital. So um, our community healthcare centers carry a very heavy burden and it can get extremely busy, especially after hours when, or um, over long weekends, when our clinics are not open. So this case happened exactly over a long weekend. So it was an eight week old baby, HIV exposed, PCR at birth was negative, and the mom stopped breastfeeding after six weeks uh, because she returned to work. So the baby presents to the community healthcare center with a history of poor feeding, vomiting and diarrhea, and swelling of the abdomen. So when they examine him, they find that the baby is irritable, has a, a very mild temperature, elevated temperature, but the abdomen is soft, but slightly distended. Blood glucose of eight. So they make a diagnosis of gastroenteritis and give the baby a, a stat dose of keftriaxone, which wouldn't make sense really if you look at the diagnosis, but nonetheless, they discharged the baby then with paracetamol and oral rehydration solution. But then very sadly, 12 hours later, this baby demised at home. So my question is, how is it possible that this baby demised? Because he had such an unremarkable history and physical examination. So what were the clues that they were dealing with a more serious problem? 
So in my district, 90% of the deaths outside of the neonatal period occurs in the age group younger than six months. And when we do our CHIP reviews, we find that the most common diagnosis that we make when their deaths are reviewed is serious bacterial infection stroke sepsis. So we are not doing well at recognizing the severe illness in this age group. Um, these babies have got very limited reserve, so they can look fine. And then a few hours later, they can actually be critically ill. The clinical signs are so incredibly subtle and they can easily be missed or misinterpreted. And then of course, the children are incorrectly managed. Um, and sadly, many of these children do not die in our healthcare facilities, but they die at home. And we actually often do not even hear of them, or we are made aware of it if a family comes back asking you to, to complete a death certificate. It is so common, just this morning, I had two phone calls. The one was from one of our clinics, where they had a two-month-old who was also presenting with vomiting and diarrhea and dehydration, and another one from my district hospital, where they had a four-month-old with also serious bacterial infection. So it is very common. So who are the babies that you really need to have a very high index of suspicion for when they are coming into your facility? So it is this, the baby who was a small neonate. Either he was a premature baby or it was a low for gestational age baby. The baby who was one of a multiple pregnancy, either a twin or a triplet, or maybe a, a 10, what's a 10 babies. Um, so they, they really do not do well um, in our system. Um, growth failure. Most of the babies that we admit that has end up with the diagnosis of severe acute malnutrition actually present to our facility with a serious bacterial infection. Babies who are formula fed, um, babies who are exposed to HIV, even if they are PCR negative, um, an unsafe water supply, uh, difficult socioeconomic conditions. And then the mom, if the mom is not doing well, either physically or mentally, emotionally, then the baby is definitely at high risk of a poorer outcome. So it's something that I've learned over many years is to, when I'm looking at a baby, to also just keep a very close eye on the mom and to see what her condition is. So when you look at, at resources um, like IMCI, they would usually talk about the baby under two months as a high-risk baby. Um, but I, I like to stretch it a little and I think we need to individualize. So I like to stretch it up to six months. And of course, if you are dealing with a malnourished baby or an expert baby, I even like to extend this danger age group even further. So the presenting complaint. And here is what does a baby do? A baby doesn't do that much. So what can the baby complain about or the parent complain about? They basically would tell you that the baby does not want to drink, um, that the baby is feeling warm. Um, they very seldom complain that the baby is too cold, that the baby is vomiting, having loose stools, crying too much, um, that the baby is having difficulty in breathing. Very commonly, guys, I hear this thing that the baby's tummy is swollen. Um, convulsions. And one of the bad parts of, of being a DCST is that we have to review all the the pediatric deaths in our district. And one thing that I commonly see is that people underestimate the history uh, provided to, the, to them by the caregiver. Um, they kind of assume that she's a young or an inexperienced mom. So if she tells you that the baby does not want to drink, they kind of dismiss it a little. So on the, the physical exam, um, before you touch that baby, just uncover the baby so that you can see the baby, but 
refrain from doing a physical exam for a while, okay? Most of the things that you need to know about the physical exam of a baby in this age group, now I'm talking about beyond neonate to six months, you can actually find those signs without touching the baby by just observing. So the first thing to look at is the alertness of the baby. Is the baby crying and screaming? And often yeah, it is like a high pitched, irritating noise and you cannot console this baby. Often with that, they're also very jittery, almost like somebody who's had too much um, Coke cool drink to drink. They are irritated. Um, on the other side, when things get worse, they can become lethargic. And then they are unaware of the surroundings, the mother's presence, and you cannot wake them up. Um, when they become hypotonic and they do not really move about, there's a, a danger sign for you. Obviously check for a convulsion and there are subtle convulsions that you need to keep an eye open for, like um, cycling. So the, the baby's legs will physically look as if he is on a bicycle. A baby who is lip smacking, so it looks like he is sucking on a dummy, even though there's nothing. Um, eyes deviating or focal convulsions. And the baby who is in life-threatening difficulty becomes very quiet. So that means they, they do not draw attention to themselves in wards and in waiting areas. So they can often sit there quietly for hours before somebody actually observes that there's a baby that they need to pay attention to. And often in the ward, you would hear in the morning when they were doing, the sisters were doing their morning um, round with their vital signs, that they found a baby dead in the bed. Then look at the baby's ability to feed. If the baby is unable to latch onto the breast or the bottom, if the baby is too sleepy, uh, or he cries so much that he doesn't even try to feed. And if the, if the, the mommy can get the baby to, to take the, the, the bottle or the breast into, into his mouth, he just suckles for a few moments and then stops. Or the baby really tries, but he gets so tired and short of breath that he cannot really finish his feed. Um, so remember, for a baby, feeding and drinking is a bit like exercise. Um, I once heard a pediatrician say that when they looked at the amount of energy that a baby uses to finish a feed, it is the same as it is for an adult to climb stairs up to the seventh story of a building. So imagine if you are feeling sick and every three hours you are made to climb stairs. Then observe the color of the baby. And this picture here on the left is actually an excellent picture because it really shows the, the gray tint to the baby's skin tone. Um, which is a very good sign of, of a sepsis. Baby can also present with a new onset jaundice. Then look at how hard this baby is working while he is breathing. Um, the clinical sign I find most commonly missed is grunting. Okay, so um, Nursing staff often think that grunting means that the baby is uncomfortable or in pain, and they do not realize that it's actually a sign of imminent respiratory failure. Um, just this morning, the call that I had from the clinic, I could hear the baby grunting over the phone. And the sad thing about this work of breathing is as the baby gets sicker, these signs are more difficult to see because obviously he loses muscle tone. So he cannot show you that he is working hard to breathe. And it can even be absent while your baby is dying of a pneumonia. Then this is a really important clinical sign guys is when you have sepsis, the chemical mediators that your body releases causes the capillary vessels to leak. 
That's one of the reasons why they develop hypovolemia and shock. So you need to look out for those signs associated with a capillary leak. So in a baby, this slight puffiness of the eyelids, it is normal in a newborn, eh? but outside of that period, it would not be normal. Uh, a baby having puffy hands and feet, and then the swollen abdomen, like I've told you, I come across so many times in, in the history of these babies. Um, I think it is maybe a combination of an ileus as well as fluid leaking into the abdominal cavity. Then look at the skin for signs of a bacterial infection. Um, whenever we think of bacterial infection, we always think of the two main entry portals into the, into the system as the respiratory system and the gut. But the third system is, some, is a system that staff seem to be blind to, and that is the skin. So I don't, here in East London, maybe because it's so humid, we have a lot of scabies amongst our babies. And, um, I think it is so common that, that staff just don't see it anymore and they, they don't treat it and, and they don't understand the significance, especially once there's a secondary bacterial infection in it. Then the vesicles, as you can see in that baby in the middle photo, and the omphalitis, and very common with the omphalitis is that red flare around the umbilicus. Okay. Then vital signs. I always tell this to sisters in our hospital, vital signs are vital. When I look at the files of the babies who demise when we do our chip meetings, it always starts off with an abnormal vital sign that people just ignore. Um, hypothermia is just as important as a fever in these babies. Tachy and bradycardias, saturation drop would be a very late sign, which means he's now getting so tired that he cannot compensate anymore. Hypoglycemia, which you all know, but hyperglycemia is just as common in a baby with sepsis. Then I want to ask you, and I, I always do this when I do ward rounds in the hospitals with the, with the sisters, and the junior nurses, who are the people who are taking the vital signs in your facility. So I would look at the vital sign that she took in the last three hours and I would ask her, is this normal or is this abnormal? And guys, most of them do not know. So they do not know what the vital signs are or the, what's the normal range for the different age groups. I don't blame them that they cannot remember it because it is quite, quite overwhelming. So print out a little poster for them. I'm sure you can find it on Google if you just Google it and attach it to the trolley that they use for their vital signs in your ward as well as in your casualty department. So that when there is an abnormality that they actually know what they are looking at. Then the growth pattern. Whenever I see a sick child, one of the first things that I ask the mom for is the road to health book. So if the child has had poor growth or the child has lost weight since the last time, that is a very high risk patient. Check the capillary refill. Um, a capillary refill longer than three seconds, baby with cold hands and feet with a tachycardia, low volume pulse and lethargy, two of those signs would mean that the baby is in shock and needs an immediate intravenous fluid bolus. Check for dehydration and you need to distinguish between shock and dehydration. Eh? Um, dehydration takes a long time to develop and you have a longer time to, uh, to fix it where a shock is immediately life-threatening and you need to intervene immediately. Uh, and one of the good signs of dehydration is if you have a recent weight of the baby, maybe the baby was at the clinic a week ago and now you weigh him again there in your casualty department and you see that he has suddenly lost a lot of weight, 
then you know this baby is dehydrated, even if you might not be able to, to clinically pick it up. Especially in the very young baby, the ex um, loss weight loss is a, is a very good sign of dehydration. On the topic of, of weights, just make sure that in the facility where you work, in the casualty department, that they actually have a working baby scale and that they weigh every baby who comes into your facility all the time, day and night, weekends, or always. Okay, so here I have a little video that I would like to share with you. Um, it is made by this company called Global Health Media. And it's an amazing resource. And it has all these conditions that it shows very short videos. So here you can see a picture of a baby who's presenting with obviously black and near. You can see his belly because his stump is not looking great. But what I really wanted you to see in this video is the subtle signs of sepsis. So they will um, demonstrate very nicely. So you can see the baby is looking jaundiced, but look at those eyes. Very auditory edema address. I'm, I'm hearing the sound which you guys are not hearing, so I have to talk over it, so it's a little confusing. So like I said, it can be hypothermia or hypothermia. So yes, he's just asking about the danger signs, like is the baby able to drink? Asking about vomiting, diarrhea, and irritability. Okay, so can you guys see there the periorbital edema that I was referring to? which is checking for jaundice, checking for drawing, fast breathing, which is there, but subtle. And then the abdomen. So what you can see there, and that's why I wanted you to look at that video, is how subtle the signs is of the periorbital edema and uh, the signs of the capillary leak, which to me is really like the crux of saying this baby is having such a severe bacterial infection that is actually on the, on the verge of developing septic shock if he's not already shocked. So in neonatology, in district neonatology, there's this little recipe that we use whenever we're dealing with a, a sick neonate. Um, the acronym for it is called USHI. But um, you can just as well apply this acronym to the septic infant. So it stands for hourly observations. Always give oxygen, even though you might not see respiratory distress. When we think of sugar, we think easy hypoglycemia, hypoglycemic. And how am I going to provide sustenance to this baby while he is recovering? Thinking of heat and you know, you're dealing with a very sick baby, they cannot heat themselves. So it doesn't help to wrap them in a blanket or a space blanket or something like that. You do need to put a heater on that baby. Um, we have incubators in our pediatric ward and we would put these septic babies into our incubators if they are hypothermic. Then in infection, treat the infection with the appropriate antibiotic. So whenever you are standing in front of a very sick child and you feel 
overwhelmed like you want to run away, as long as your brain can remember the Ushi word, you are well on your way to stabilizing this baby. So like I said, you would give them oxygen. If we decide that the baby is in shock, you would give him a fluid bolus of normal saline. Now the volume there is 20 moles per kilogram, but like I said, most of our SAM babies are coming in with serious bacterial infection. So you need, before you give a baby an IV fluid bolus, you need to decide whether you are dealing with a malnourished baby or not. And a word of warning, guys, if you are sitting with a two, three-month-old baby with severe acute malnutrition, it's not a type of malnutrition that you can spot with your eyes. So they are not obviously um, marasmic. Um, they sometimes look a little out of proportion that you think their head is, is a bit bigger than, than their body, if you look at them like that. But if you do not take out that road to health book and go and plot this baby, it is highly unlikely that you're going to pick up the severe acute malnutrition in this age group. And you can just imagine how tiny that little heart is with this already weakened heart muscle. So if you give him a too large fluid bolus, you are going to push him into cardiac failure. So always check before you give a fluid bolus. The other advice when you are dealing with a baby with shock is once you've decided what the volume of fluid is that the baby needs, do not walk away from that baby. Administer that fluid bolus yourself. Bring the bag of saline there, go and have a seat next to the baby and inject that 50 mil or 100 mil, whatever the volume is, yourself. Do not ask somebody else to do it for you. And then immediately, once you're finished, you would reassess to, si to decide whether the, the shock is actually resolved. You can give up to three boluses. But my advice is, once you get to the point where you are considering giving a third bolus, I would give, a, give your referral hospital a call just to tell them that you are dealing with a baby like that and that the baby most likely will need a referral because he will need inotropic support. Like I already said, the baby needs an external heat source. And the absolute minimum is three hourly vital signs and glucose checks. Then when you give antibiotics, you must cover for gram negative bacteria. So these babies are coming into our facilities with community acquired gram negative infections. So we're talking about E. coli, Scipialis. So you, if you send this baby home with amoxicillin and Bernardo, oh, he's going to have a terrible outcome, right? So if the baby is older than two months, you can give him Kefrahexan. If he's younger than two months, you will have to use Kefrodaxin. But always on top of that, add gentamicin as well so that you have excellent gram-negative cover. Consider the possibility of a staph septicemia and depending on what you have in our facilities at the moment we do not have cloxacillin intravenously so we have to use kefazolin as an alternative to IV cloxa and that first dose of antibiotics the moment when you suspect that this baby has a bacterial infection you need to immediately give that dose um, do not delay, do not wait until the baby is in the ward after all the administration has been done before the baby gets his first dose of antibiotics. Then feeds and fluids. So if the baby has a hypoglycemia, you will give him 10% dextrose and recheck after 15 minutes and make sure that the sisters understand the importance of rechecking and recording until the glucose is normal. If the glucose is high, which is very common, guys, it is because of the cortisol that the baby is releasing, do not think that this baby has now diabetes. At least do not give him insulin. If these babies are given, given a dose of a short-acting insulin, the glucose literally falls to zero. And, and it's very, very difficult to manage them from there. 
So always the ideal is for the baby to still be drinking his or her usual milk. But now you have to decide looking at the condition of your baby. Um, is it safe? Is there a risk that the baby can aspirate? Um, is the baby maybe having an ileus? So if I'm seeing a baby and I think the baby has a life-threatening illness, I would give him IV fluid only for 12 to maybe 24 hours. But if you are going to go the IV route only, be very careful of overhydrating. So only use 100 mils per kg, right, as your, as your maintenance. If you're going to give him milk, you're going to give it to him as 150 mils per kg. Now, remember what I said, if you are, as if a baby is sucking, it is exercise. So you want to feed this baby passively. So I would give him his usual milk per oral or nasal gastric tube until I can see that the baby has recovered enough to be able to suckle safely. Um, if you recognize serious bacterial infection and you start your treatment immediately, infants are so incredible that they recover so quickly that you will actually start to doubt your diagnosis. You will admit it at, at, at nighttime and you will think this baby is going to die. And tomorrow morning when you get there, he's looking fine. Um, and that is the classical thing that we see with babies who come in with community acquired serious bacterial infections. They recover incredibly quickly. Now, ideally, you would like to confirm your diagnosis with blood results, but I know practically in many of our hospitals, it can take 24 to 48 hours before you get your basic cusp and full blood count and CRP result back, which obviously means this is most likely a diagnosis that you will make on the basis of clinical suspicion. You can always, after a few days, decide when your bloods come back and it shows that it was a viral infection that you can de-escalate your care. The next thing is, um, like I said, I spend a lot of time looking at files of, of babies who, who demise in our facilities. And that's why I want to encourage you to walk in your patient's shoes. And with that, I mean, follow the route that a caregiver and their child will take from when they arrive at your facility until they are seen by you as the doctor, maybe in your casualty or outpatient department, however it works in your facility, and the route that they take from there until they are in the ward especially after hours and over weekends. Where are the roadblocks? We have had a case where the security turned people away at the gate over a weekend saying that they are only dealing with trauma. And because the, it was a, a mom who didn't stand up for herself and, and she walked away and the baby actually died. Um, are young children being prioritized in your waiting area? Is there somebody who's actually looking at them? Remember what I said, it's the quiet baby who's the baby who's in danger. Are the people who are doing triaging able to recognize the sick infant? And that's the one nice thing about a small hospital is you get to know everybody, you know, you can build a personal relationship with everybody from the security officer to the casualty staff to the ward staff and train every single body that they know what a sick baby looks like. Explain to them why it is important, why these babies are in danger and not to send them away. And what you can use is these videos at Global Health Media. They are very simple training videos. Um, some of them are aimed at moms and some of them are aimed at healthcare workers. We, and you can download them onto your device so you can use it to train your staff so that everybody understands that these are priority patients who need to be seen immediately. Another issue that I know is very prevalent in, in district hospitals is 
do you have a system where you hand over your patients to your colleagues? Um, do you red flag them? Do they know when they are on call over the weekend? Because obviously they need to cover the whole hospital. They can't see everybody. Do they know who they need to go and see in the pediatrics ward? Um, and then almost every single baby that we admit in our facility with a serious bacterial infection is not being breastfed. So what I've seen is our staff think that the things that we as doctors are keeping ourselves busy with and that we talk about a lot and spend a lot of time with is the important things. So are you as a doctor taking an interest in the initiation of breastfeeding in your postnatal ward? Oftentimes it is the most junior nurse in the unit who is tasked with supporting moms to start breastfeeding. And as as doctors, we actually take a very casual interest in breastfeeding initiation. Then, do you have the actual practical skills to help a woman who tells you that she's having a problem with breastfeeding? One of the most common reasons that women would tell you that they stop breastfeeding is when they would say, I don't have enough milk. How are you going to respond to her? And how are you going to assist her? Do you have that basic skill? Do your nurses have that skill? Um, and we are in such a hurry to discharge women out of our postnatal ward that we send them home and breastfeeding is not really established. She's still struggling. And when she is alone at home with nobody to support her, she just stops and she switches to formula feed. Um, and breastfeeding is not a natural thing. It's not just something that you pick up a baby and everybody automatically gets it right. So, um, here is a checklist that you can use. It comes from the World Health Organization that helps you to, to guide you to how to assist a mom that, uh, to see whether she's breastfeeding well and how the breastfeeding is going. And you can really use that in your postnatal ward. And I would suggest that you make it part of your pre-discharge paperwork um, to show that you have really paid attention to the uh, mother's ability to breastfeed successfully. Um, so as Madeleine said in the introduction, I do believe that at primary health care level, we have to be able to do the basics correctly. And if we do that correctly, we can actually save most of the children who come into our facilities. So use your ward rounds, teach the nursing staff, the mothers, the supporting staff, let all of them join you on your ward rounds and, and discuss your cases and challenge them a little so that each time when they do a ward round with you that they learn something. When I speak with, my, with the nursing staff, I always make sure they understand that what they are doing is important and why it is important. Uh, and do not assume that the person has mastered a basic skill. Um, so, like I said, Global Health Media has a series of videos where they talk about the absolute basic things about breastfeeding, how to support somebody who's breastfeeding, how to spot when there's a problem, how to fix it. But they also have a series of videos on looking after the small baby, on things like how to cup feed, because we just tell the nurse, cup feed the baby, but are you sure she can? Do you, does she know how to do it? Can you help if, if she struggles? So guys, have a look at this. Um, I think you will enjoy it very much. Um, and it is worthwhile downloading some of those onto your phone so you can share it with your staff as you are doing rounds. And you can check it for yourself whether you have actually acquired that knowledge and the skill. So my final piece of advice to you is have a high index of suspicion for serious bacterial infection. It is the most common cause of pediatric deaths. 
vomiting and diarrhea in a high risk category is seldom due to a virus, right? So go and look at the statistics for your hospital and see if you are having a large number of children who are dying with the diagnosis of gastro. And I want to challenge you, go and reassess it and see whether you have not missed serious bacterial infections. It is very seldom that we are seeing children dying from viral gastroenteritis these days. If you are unsure whether it is a serious bacterial infection, it is much safer to admit and start the baby on IV antibiotics. You can always de-escalate care. And when you do give antibiotics, you must think gram negatives, must cover. Watch out for overhydration. It is much safer to feed the nasogastric tube than it is to use intravenous fluid. Oh, especially if you are dealing with a SAM baby, guys, stay away from IV fluids. Listen to the caregiver, listen to the nurse who says there's a problem. The quiet baby is the one in trouble. Look in your system at the roadblocks where the baby will, where there will be a delay um, for the baby to get help. And at the bottom of serious bacterial infection, and the problem that it is, is breastfeeding initiation in our delivery units. Um, that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lizelle. That feels like life-saving advice on almost every single slide um, and a bumper pack. And I love the idea of the videos. I'll make sure to put those links on our pediatric resource pack that we're putting it out um, tomorrow. I'm going to launch a poll. Um, these are quite important in terms of us keeping track of who's on the call. So please do give us some feedback and it also helps us to determine what is useful in terms of um, where you guys are at at the moment. Um, and I can already see, yes, that this is definitely a presentation that has, has hit the right level in terms of what we need when we're seeing patients in our OPDs and in our casualties. Um, if you have any questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can put up a hand, or even if you just want to make a comment, you are very welcome to. Um, and if neither of those are working, you can literally just un unmute uh, yourself and see if there's any questions. Looks like I think most questions have been answered. Great, there's some lovely, oh good, I'm glad to see clinical associate students. Yes, please, all of these presentations are going to be recorded. Um, they're all recorded, they're on the Radasa YouTube page, they're public, and we're very welcome for you to also send them to nursing teams, to clinical associate teams, to having them as a CPD meeting with some of your other colleagues where you're working. Um, so this is a, a useful resource to take into the future as well. And thank you, yes, for all of those feedback on our polls, excellent. And some lovely feedback in terms of the usefulness from from our participants now thank you for this important presentation thank you for lovely presentation thank you it was great very useful thank you excellent Lizelle, it doesn't look like there's too many um urgent questions coming through i think there was a very nice thorough um going through all the little details in terms of assessing a case i don't know if there's any last things you would like to add or any last thoughts that you have no madeline thank you Thank you very much. So tomorrow evening, we're going to move on to um, an, a standardized approach to the child coming into your emergency medicine unit. Um, and that will be slightly looking also at older children and looking at much wider than just the bacterial infection. Um, and we've got also another Eastern Cape pediatrician, Dr. Motimele, who's just finished her um, her specialization here in, in East London. And we're really looking forward to her presentation tomorrow evening. So please note that it's on Tuesday evening at six o'clock, slightly different day, slightly different time. Um, and again, we will record those and make those available as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. And then also the pediatric resource packs will come out tomorrow after our um, second presentation. Good night, everybody.